Hello, everyone, and welcome to 2021 Virtual Girls Talk Math Saturday series. Today, we have a lecture by Dr. Olivia Prosper. Today's event will begin with an introduction, followed by a lecture, and we'll conclude with a Q&A. Audience, please feel free to use the Zoom Q&A feature or the YouTube chat to ask questions. I'll first introduce myself. I'm Sarah Cassie Burnett. I'm in my final, final year as part of the Applied Math and Statistics and Scientific Computation Program at the University of Maryland. Uh, I established the sister chapter of Girls Talk Math Camp in Maryland in 2018. And I study computational fluid dynamics and the science of predicting the future. My favorite things to do uh, outside of math are cooking, knitting, and hanging out with my little baby boy. So Girls Talk Math is a enrichment program with two goals to teach mathematics that would usually be learned in college, but at a high school level and to promote successful women in mathematics through podcast biographies. But today we'll get to hear from one of those women, Dr. Olivia Prosper. Dr. Olivia Prosper is an assistant professor in mathematics at the University of Tennessee and a faculty affiliate of the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis. Leading up to this position, she received a BS in mathematics and a minor in French in 20, uh, 2006. Her PhD in mathematics in 2012 from the University of Florida. Uh, from 2012 to 2015, she was an instructor and applied in computational mathematics, a teaching and research focus postdoctoral position at Dartmouth College. From 2015 to 2019, Dr. Prosper was an assistant professor of mathematics at the University of Kentucky. Her research interests lie at the interface between mathematics and biology, with much of her work focused on developing and analyzing mathematical models of infectious disease dynamics to better understand the interplay between different types of hetero geneities uh, affecting disease dynamics and disease control measures. She is also interested in problems related to mo model identifiability. Often there is a mismatch between the data available and the data needed to make accurate inter inter inf inferences from models. Last but not least, Dr. Prosper is a wife to an incredibly supportive husband and the mother of two beautiful boys. So, Doctor, I'll let you begin when you're ready. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, thank you for everybody who is here virtually with us. And I want to thank the organizers of this program for inviting me to speak today. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about mathematics and our health. Um, and let's see, make sure I can click through. All right, so the last decade has seen a number of different epidemics. Um, so of course we are experiencing one right now, um, but, but this isn't uh, totally unique, right? We had um, a cholera outbreak in Haiti. Um, we had in West Africa, the Ebola outbreak. You may be familiar with the Zika virus um, that is spread by mosquitoes to humans and was particularly dangerous for pregnant women and their babies. Uh, in 2018, we saw a worse flu season than, than usual. And then of course, um, we can't uh, ignore the fact that we've been going through the COVID-19 pandemic um, for the past year and a half or so. Um, and this uh, particular article here um, is one that I was interviewed for. And so you might ask the question, well, why, why are they asking a mathematician about um, the spread of disease? Okay, and so that's one of the things that I want to address today. So why ask a mathematician about coronavirus, for example? Um, so let me start by just saying quickly what public health is. So it's the science of protecting the safety and improving the health of communities through education, policy making, and research for disease and injury prevention. And there are a number of different types of questions that somebody in public health might be interested in answering. So for example, during the Ebola outbreak, they might have been interested in knowing how many cases of Ebola there would be in the uh, uh, subsequent month. Where will Zika virus appear next? 
Can we reduce the spread of antimicrobial resistance? And then there could be questions that aren't related to infectious disease at all. Things like how can we prevent kidney disease patients from developing anemia? And what is the best treatment regimen for cancer patients? And the cool thing is that mathematicians have tools at their disposal that can be used to try and address some of these questions, particularly if they're working closely with people who have um, the biological knowledge about these types of systems. So what can mathematics tell us about these types of problems and how do mathematicians actually go about it? And that's what I hope to give some insight into today. So there's a very famous quote, at least amongst uh, mathematical modelers, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and so what is meant by this? So the world that we live in is extremely complicated, right? There's a lot of things that we have to take into consideration or that, that play a role in into things like the spread of infectious disease. There's the climate, the weather, um, there's you know people's behavior. All of these things are incredibly complicated and in reality affect um, the physical system that we're talking about here, the spread of infectious disease. Um, and there's no way that we can incorporate all of these things into some system of equations um, using mathematics. Um, but the goal is to try and boil down the problem into some key components that we can represent mathematically and have enough detail to be able to answer our question and be useful. So first, what is a mathematical model? It is a representation or description of a physical system. And the physical system, again, that I'm going to be talking about today is infectious disease, the spread of infectious disease. So can we design a model that is useful for understanding the spread of infectious disease? Let's say that we're thinking about a, um, a disease like influenza, right? It's, it's spread from human to human through either close contacts. It could be that you know a person is coughing or sneezing in the vicinity of somebody else, or they might touch um, a surface and contaminate that surface, surface, and then somebody else comes along and touches it and becomes infected in that way. So these kinds of close contacts uh, result in transmission from one person to another for something like influenza. So how can we construct a model for that particular disease? Uh, this idea that developed in the early 1900s um, is it's called a compartmental model. The idea is that you divide up your population into compartments according to whether they are susceptible, infected, and infectious, or recovered from the disease. And then our goal as mathematicians is to try and figure out, okay, well, how can we describe how many people are in each of those states over time? And the way that we go about trying to answer that question is to first figure out how people move from one state to the next. So for example, I'm gonna walk through how you can figure out how many people move from susceptible to infected in one day, okay? So in other words, we want to write down an equation that represents this first arrow. So the first thing that we, so first let me just mention that in the world of um, epidemiology, this is called incidence, the number of new infected individuals per day. Um, and we want to figure out how to actually express that mathematically. So again, let's think about how transmission actually happens for something like influenza. So let's pretend that I am one infected person and I want to figure out how many people am I going to infect each day? So, um, what I first need to think about is how many people do I come into contact with? And that can be written down in a, in a number of different ways. But one of the simplest assumptions that you can make is that the number of contacts you make each day is proportional to the size of the population that you're in. The idea being that if I am in New York City, for example, with a large population, I'm likely to come into contact with more people than if I am in my current hometown, Knoxville, Tennessee, which is consider considerably smaller. Um, and that can be expressed by some number C, a contact rate times what I'm calling the total population size, capital N here. But not all of these contacts are going to be with people who are available to be infected. So in order for me to uh, produce a new infection or to in infect another person, that person has to be susceptible to the disease. So I need to think about, well, what 
proportion or what fraction of those contacts that I make in a day are with susceptible people. And again, that's something that I can actually express mathematically under some simplifying assumptions of uh, the population being what we call well mixed. Okay. And so in this case, we would take the total number of people that are susceptible divided by the total population size. And that would give me the probability that my contact is with a susceptible person. But again, just because me as an infected person, just because I come into contact with a susceptible individual, doesn't mean that every time that person will become infected. So now I want to multiply by that the probability that transmission is actually successful. And I'm going to call that P. Okay, and that would give me those three things multiplied together gives me how many people I infect in one day. But I'm probably not the only infected person in the population. So now we want to take this and multiply it by the total number of infected people in the population to get the total number of new infections per day. Okay, and that gives me my incidence, number of new infected individuals each day. And so that's going to tell me how many people move from this susceptible compartment to the infected compartment in one day. And so again, this gives me some mathematical expression now, an equation that describes this quantity. Um, and uh, if you do a little bit, bit of algebra here, you see that some terms cancel and it simplifies to this C times P, which is just going to be some number times the number of susceptible individuals and the number of infected individuals. And what's commonly done is to replace that product C times P by a, this Greek letter beta. And that's known as the transmission rate in the world of mathematical um, epidemiology, okay? So that tells us how people move from the susceptible to the infected class. And there's also a way to come up with an expression for how people move from the infected to the recovered class. Okay, and when we write this all down, we get a system of equations that looks like this. So for those of you who have some experience with calculus, then these terms might look familiar. Um, this would give you the instantaneous rate of change in the susceptible population, infected population and recovered population. Um, but for those who may not be familiar with, um, with these uh, derivatives, you can think of it as just an expression uh, denoting that how, how these classes change. Okay, so the first term is the change in the susceptible population, for example. And so we take that term that we derived earlier, the number of new infections per day, and we want to remove that from the susceptible class. And so that's why you have that negative sign. The change should be decreasing. The number of susceptible people should be decreasing, going down as people become infected. And then those individuals move into the infected class at that same rate. Likewise, we're going to remove people from the infected class and move them to the recovered class when they recover. So we get a system of equations here that's called um, a system of ordinary differential equations. And this model is a very famous model. It's called the SIR model for susceptible infected recovered. And it's formed the basis for a lot of um, mathematical models for infectious disease that you'll see today. Okay, so back to the, the question at hand, we want to, ideally, what we want to know is how many people are in each of these classes over time. And in particular, we really want to know how many people are in the infected class at any point in time. And that's given by this red curve here. And I can produce a graph like this by telling my computer how many people are in each of these classes to begin with. So in this particular simulation, I start off with 950 people in the susceptible class, 50 people in the infected class, and zero people in the recovered class. Um, and then I also have to tell my computer some values for those what we call parameters, alpha and beta. So alpha, again, is my recovery rate, and beta is the transmission rate. Okay, so I have to give some numbers, and then I can simulate the model and get these what we call solutions to the differential equation. Okay, so now I can see if we have these values for the parameters in the model, this is what the um, dynamics of the disease will look like over time. Okay, and so again, this picture is produced by having just specific values for each of those terms, the alpha and the beta. 
And so what I want to show next is how this curve changes depending on what those values are. Okay. Okay, so on the left here, I have a, a movie of how this the number of infected people is changing over time. So I've got time on this axis. And on this axis is the number of infected people. I'm going to increase the transmission rate beta. And we're going to see how that changes what the um, what this trajectory of infected cases looks like. Okay, so initially, we see that the infections would just die out on their own. But as we increase that transmission rate, then we start to see an outbreak. And that peak in the outbreak, it starts to move more and closer and closer to the left, meaning that the outbreak happens earlier and earlier as you increase that transmission rate. And so you can think about what things might increase the transmission rate. Um, so if we go back to that derivation that we went through, one of the components of the transmission rate was the number of contacts that a person makes in a day. So increasing your contacts would increase this parameter beta and make it more likely to have and make you more likely to have an outbreak. So again, if we have a small transmission rate or low number of contacts, the disease will just die out on its own. But if we have a large transmission rate, then we expect to see an outbreak. Okay, what happens if we instead increase the recovery rate? Um, so first, let's think about what kinds of things would increase the recovery rate. So keep in mind that increasing the recovery rate moves people from infected to recovered faster, which is a good thing. Um, so one thing that we can do is try to treat people earlier or to once we identify that somebody's infected to encourage them to, to stay at home so that they don't uh, go out in the world and infect other people. So those are a couple ways that we can increase the recovery rate. Um, so let's see what happens. So with the small recovery rate, so that means it takes a long time to move from the infected state to the recovered state, we have an outbreak. But let's see what happens as we increase the recovery rate, that peak in the number of infected people decreases, okay? And then eventually the recovery is so fast that the disease is just going to die out on its own, okay? Okay, so one of the questions that we are interested in is whether there will be an outbreak. So we saw that depending on the, on the values of these two parameters, alpha and beta, the transmission and the recovery rates, um, we can have different outcomes. Either the disease could die out or we could have an outbreak and the size of the outbreak will also change depending on what those values of the parameters actually are. And you may have gotten a sense from what I just uh, showed you with those videos that those are things that we might be able to actually control with some kind of public health measures. Um, so let's kind of think through this a bit. Um, first, I want to point out um, uh, this concept of the basic reproduction number R0, which is something you may have heard about if you've been following the COVID-19 pandemic over the past um, year and a half. So. The definition is that it's the number of new infected individuals resulting from a single infected individual in an otherwise fully susceptible population while they are infected. Now, that's kind of a mouthful. So I want to illustrate what, 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 this, uh, what this really means, okay? So the basic reproduction number is going to be some number bigger than zero for a particular disease in a particular location. Um, so let's say that the basic reproduction number is two. Um, what this means is that if we start off with one infected person, then that person will go on to infect on average two other people during the time that they're infected. And then those two people will go on to infect on average two additional people and so on. And that process continues. And so you can see how if let's say that R0 was 10, then the disease is going to spread a lot more quickly. If R0 is one, then you would just see kind of a straight line here of this person infects one person and that person might infect one another person and so on. And so if R0 is equal to one, then the disease will probably not have a chance to spread. So the idea from a public health perspective is that if we can reduce this reproduction number below one, then we would expect the disease to die out. If the reproduction number is bigger than one, then we expect an outbreak to, to be possible. Okay, so 
the goal often is to try and reduce this number below one or to make it as small as we can. So what does this mean for different types of diseases? So here we have a list of some, um, some diseases from least contagious to most contagious. So you can think of a small R0 as being less contagious than a large R0. So for hepatitis C and Ebola, we have an R0 of two, for HIV, an R0 of four. And then on the far end here, you have mumps with an R0 of 10 and measles an R0 of 18. So this is pretty, pretty wild, right? One person can infect 18 other people. Um, and so you can see how uh, this disease could spread extremely quickly um, if we don't uh, implement any kind of control measures. Okay, and so in fact, um, although we have a vaccine for, um, so for mumps and measles, for example, so um, if you, you may be familiar with the, the MMR vaccine, that's measles, mumps, and rubella that's given to young children. Um, so we have this very effective vaccine, um, but we still have seen in recent years some outbreaks of measles. Um, so this is just one headline, for example, where um, there was a measles outbreak in uh, Disneyland in California. And so I'm going to try and, and demonstrate how using mathematics, how we can, um, why something like this might happen, despite the fact that we have this vaccine. Okay, so when will there be an outbreak? So let's look at that picture that we had earlier. So again, here we have our number of infected individuals over time. So initially we see that the number of infected individuals is increasing until eventually we really reach this peak and then it decreases um, towards zero over time. Okay, so what does it mean to have an outbreak then? Well, one way to characterize an outbreak is that you have this initial increase, right? Um, in the number of infected people. And mathematically, that would be equivalent to this uh, change in I, the infected population, being greater than zero at this initial time. And so we can change that into this inequality here. And basically what we have here is that if this quantity on the left, which is some number, is bigger than one, then an outbreak will happen, okay? And the cool thing is that that quantity um, is exactly this basic reproduction number or R0 that I described earlier. Okay, so you can actually take this mathematical expression and interpret it biologically. So the first piece here, the beta times S0, is the number of people infected in one day at the beginning of the outbreak. And the second term is the number of days infected. And that is exactly that definition that I showed you earlier. So this is really great, right? We have this uh, definition that comes from epidemiology and we have this mathematical expression that tells us when an outbreak will happen and those two things actually agree with each other. And that's really important, right? This means that we can actually use our mathematics to try and answer some questions that are important to public health. Okay, so another term that you may have heard in the news is this idea of herd immunity. Um, and so here the goal is to try and vaccinate enough people to bring that reproduction number below one, right? That's what's going to allow the disease to hopefully die out on its own. Um, so the idea here is that there's no way that we can possibly vaccinate everyone, right? Even if everybody wanted to be vaccinated, not everybody can be vaccinated. For example, young children can't receive certain vaccines and then certain people, it would not be healthy for them to, to receive a vaccine, right? So there's no way we can possibly vaccinate everyone, um, but hopefully we can vaccinate enough people to keep these diseases under, from, from just going rampant. Okay, so we start off with our basic reproduction number, which is the case where no one is vaccinated. And then let's assume that some fraction of our population P is vaccinated against a particular disease, let's say flu, for example, okay? We call that the control reproduction number. So that's why I have this uh, subscript C here. So this would be our controlled reproduction number. This one minus P is the fraction of people that aren't um, vaccinated, um, but this, do you see how that the proportion P is reducing? It's making our, our reproduction number smaller. And our goal is to try and make this thing less than one so that the disease can die out. And this is equivalent to 
P, the proportion vaccinated, being larger than one minus one over R naught. So what does this actually mean? So let's say that we have the example where R naught is equal to two. Then this would mean that we need to vaccinate at least 50% of the population in order to achieve herd immunity, or in other words, in order for the disease to be under control. Okay, so that's not too bad. So instead of having to vaccinate everybody, in this case, we only need to vaccinate half of the population. This is, of course, assuming that we have a perfect vaccine. Um, no vaccine is perfect, but some um, are very effective. But if you have a less effective vaccine, then you would need to vaccinate more people. Okay, so let's go back to that picture we had before um, and see what is that vaccination threshold then for these different diseases. So as we said, if we have an R naught of two, then you would need to vaccinate at least half of the population. But if we go all the way up to measles with an R naught of 18, then you would need to vaccinate 95% of the population at least. Okay, and so from this perspective, we can see why if vaccination rates drop by even a little bit, that allows the opportunity for outbreaks to happen like the one in Disney World, Disneyland. Okay, so how is this related or relevant to what we're all going through right now? Um, so the model that I've shown you so far, this SAR model is a very simple model um, and it can give us a lot of insight into infectious disease and possible ways of trying to control the spread of infectious disease. Um, but when we want to actually apply it to a real world public health problem, how do we move from that really simple model to something that can try to inform public health policies, for example, like what types of control measures might be um, effective. So one thing I want to point out is that a lot of the COVID-19 models out there have a basic underlying structure that is similar to the SIR model that we saw before, but has this extra compartment exposed. So in reality, when somebody becomes infected with uh, COVID-19, or technically speaking, infected with the virus SARS-CoV-2 that causes the disease COVID-19, um, there's going to be a period of time before that person actually becomes infectious. And so it turns out to be important to include that, that period, that delay between when you're infected and when you can actually transmit the disease to other people. Um, so underlying, some, some of these models are very complex, but at the base, a lot of them have this essential idea that people are broken up into these four states, susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered, including one of the uh, models that, that I was able to work on um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so this here, I'm just showing some, some uh, snapshots from some work um, that I did in collaboration with Nick Ruptanunchai, who's um, in the Department of Population Health Sciences at Virginia Tech and part of this World Pop group based um, uh, in the UK at the University of Southampton. Um, so my role in this was to help with some of the development of the underlying mathematical model. It was a large group of people um, that contributed to this effort. Um, and I just wanted to show here that we had this basic underlying um, idea that people are broken up into those four compartments, but you have a lot of different places um, so for example, we looked at Europe. And so for each, uh, different cities in Europe, for example, you can have people broken up in each of those cities into those four compartments. And then you can incorporate things like data about movement, how people move between different locations to build this um, more realistic, more complex model to answer questions about um, kind of what if questions, right? So if we implement this type of control strategy, what will the outcome be? And so for this particular work, the group was interested in understanding what would happen as the European countries started to relax some of their control measures. Um, particularly, they were interested in understanding um, the impact of um, non-pharmaceutical interven interventions. So things like social distancing or uh, restricting, restricting travel, that kind of thing. Um, and so, 
as things started to improve in Europe, countries were starting to think about lifting their, their restrictions. Um, and uh, this group wanted to know, well, what will be the potential effect of relaxing those control measures? And is it better for the European countries to do it in some kind of synchronized way or um, to let each country kind of do its own thing? And the, the overarching conclusion was that it would be better for the countries to do things in a coordinated fashion. But this is um, not the type of thing I normally work on. So yes, I work on modeling infectious disease, but of course I didn't work on COVID-19 before there was COVID-19. Um, so I wanna talk more about the things that I normally work on. Um, and so the model that I've shown you so far um, is appropriate when you're trying to model diseases that can be uh, transmitted from person to person. But there are a lot of diseases where that's not the mode of transmission. So for example, a lot of my work is on um, what's called a vector-borne disease, um, specifically malaria. So the idea here is that there's the vector is the mosquito. And um, in order for a human to become infected, they need to be bitten by an infectious mosquito. And then a, a healthy mosquito can also become infected by taking a blood meal from a, an infected human. So this, the transmission has to be back and forth between human and mosquito. Um, and so here you can see that because of this different mode of transmission, there are different types of control measures that you would use for this disease. So for example, using insecticide treated bed nets is really important in regions that have malaria transmission occurring. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, in order for uh, transmission to happen, uh, the, the parasite here has to pass back and forth between the, the mosquito population and the human population. And this is not a disease that we really worry about in the United States, um, but it did used to be here. Um, so this is a pamphlet that was distributed, I believe, in the 1950s in the United States. And this yellow region is showing areas of, of the southeastern US where malaria was present. And so this pamphlet was distributed to inform people about this disease, what causes the disease, um, what symptoms to, to uh, look out for, and then what, to, what kind of treatment to seek out if you think you're infected. Um, but through different types of interventions like water management strategies. So, you know, removing bodies of water where mosquitoes can breed um, and um, insecticide use, uh, uh, malaria has been um, eliminated from the United States. Um, but it remains a huge burden worldwide. So um, here are some um, World Health Organization estimates from 2018. Uh, there were over 200 million new infections of malaria, resulting in over 400,000 deaths. And unfortunately, the majority of these deaths occur in children under the age of five. Um, and the greatest contributor to, um, to these malaria uh, deaths is this parasite species called Plasmodium falciparum. So that causes um, one type of, of malaria disease in humans. Um, and the, the history of modeling of malaria goes back even further than the SIR model that I showed you. Um, so the person who is responsible for the first malaria model is Sir Ronald Ross. And he's quoted as saying, as a matter of fact, all epidemiology, concerned as it is with the variation of disease from time to time or from place to place, must be considered mathematically. However, many variables is implicated if it is to be considered scientifically at all. Okay, so he was of course, obviously a big proponent of using mathematics as a tool to, to better understand these biological systems. Um, and in fact, he uh, is the person who discovered that it was actually mosquitoes, female Anopheles mosquitoes that transmitted this parasite to humans. And then he published the first mathematical for model for malaria in 1908, which was later extended in the 1950s. And this is what that resulting model looks like. Um, so there are many variations out there, but this is kind of the basic framework. And I'm not going to go into all of the details, but now the idea is you have this parasite that's being passed back and forth between the human population and the mosquito population. And so we have to include both of those populations in our models. Um, and so on the left, you have uh, 
the humans broken up into two classes, susceptible and infected. And on the right, you have mosquitoes broken up into two classes, susceptible and infected. I just want to point out some of the major differences between this and the SIR model. So one, of course, is you have these two um, hosts, and the only way for a human to become infected is if they are bitten by an infected mosquito. And the same thing for the mosquito, the only way they can become infected is if they bite an infected human. Um, the other major difference is that you no longer see this recovered class in the human population. Um, and that's because with this parasitic disease, um, people don't develop immunity to it in the same way that you would with something like the flu virus. Um, and uh, the other thing is that because a mosquito's lifespan is very short, now you have to include things like the birth rate of the mosquitoes. So that's what this arrow is meant to represent um, and the death rate of mosquitoes. That becomes an important factor in this mathematical model because mosquitoes are, are so short lived. Okay, and just for fun, that's what these equations end up looking like. Um, and some of these, so now you'll see a bunch of different letters in here. Um, the transmission rates are going to depend on quantities like how many bites a person receives each day, for example. That's how the contacts are happening in this case. So just as with the SIR model, you can again derive the basic reproduction number for this model for malaria. And again, you can interpret it biologically. You have one portion that is going to be the number of new infected humans per infected mosquito. And the other portion is the number of new infected mosquitoes per infected human. So putting that together, we come back to exactly that um, definition of the basic reproduction number that I presented earlier. So it's gonna tell you how many new infected humans result from an infected human, but through the mosquito. Okay, so now I want to move into some of the, the um, work that I've been doing um, related to uh, malaria um, in more recent years. So as you can see, the parasite uh, dynamics are very complicated. Um, so there's a whole life cycle that the parasites go through inside the human, and then there's a whole life cycle that the parasites go through in the mosquito. And a lot of people have developed mathematical models to study how the parasite uh, numbers change over time inside a human, but not as many people have looked at what happens inside the mosquito. And it turns out that this stage is actually really important because this is the, the, this is the place where sexual reproduction of the parasites happen. So you have male and female parasites um, and they can uh, uh, fertilize and produce um, uh, new parasites. Um, so this is critical because this means that new strains of malaria can develop in that way. Um, and we call this diversity. So if you have multiple strains of the same parasite within a, a single person or a single mosquito, then we would say that that, that, that uh, person or mosquito has a diverse infection. So why do we care about that? Well, if you have this more diverse infection, then um, it's harder to treat that individual and the person is less likely to be able to, um, to cure themselves. Their immune system is less likely to be able to, um, to rid themselves of these more complicated infections. And it also makes developing effective drugs and vaccines a lot more challenging. Oh. And I, I cannot forget to acknowledge my collaborator on this work, Lauren Childs, who's an assistant professor of mathematics um, uh, at Virginia Tech. Okay, so again, we need to take this really complicated system and try to boil it down to its key components. So here I've got this cartoon of what the parasites are doing inside the mosquito. So we have um, various stages of the parasite life cycle. So we've got these male and female gametes that enter the mosquito when they take a blood meal from an infected human. The male gamete fertilizes a female gamete producing a zygote. The zygote progresses to a stage called the eukinete stage. Those progress to a stage called the oocyst stage. And then something called sporoblast formation happens inside the oocyst until the oocyst ruptures releasing thousands of parasites into the, the body of the mosquito. And then those parasites 
quickly migrate to the mosquito salivary glands. And at that stage, once the mosquito has parasites in its salivary glands, it's infectious to humans. So we wanted to develop a model of this process that keeps track of the number of parasites at each of these life cycle stages inside the, um, the mosquito. Um, and so we could do this in a similar, using the same kind of mathematics that we did for the SIR model that I showed earlier. Um, but we thought it was really important to incorporate the fact that there's going to be some variability across different mosquitoes. Not every infected mosquito is going to have exactly the same number of parasites in them over time. And so um, we were able to do that using um, what's called a stochastic model. It essentially incorporates some randomness in how these parasite numbers change over time. And so instead of seeing you know, one smooth curve like what we saw earlier in the SIR model, we get these curves that kind of jump around. So here, each of these gray curves represents um, the number of parasites in a different mosquito. So each gray curve corresponds to the parasites in a different mosquito. Okay, so um, now we have a way of modeling the number of parasites within a particular mosquito and how that changes over time. Um, but we wanted to get back to this question of diversity. So how can we keep track of the, all the different types of parasites that are inside this mosquito that's infected? And so the way that we do that is we started, we started off by assuming, okay, let's say this mosquito takes a bite from an infected human and that infected human was infected with two types of this parasite, two, let's call them strains, two strains of this parasite. Um, those strains will have different genetics. And we can represent that using a sequence. Um, here, it's represented by these little boxes. We have 24 boxes here. And if the boxes have different colors, then we can say that those two sequences are different or the genetics of those two parasites are different. And so we can actually model the process of meiosis, um, which you may have learned about in, in a biology class at some point. Um, so we model the process of recombination and reassortment at one of those parasite life cycle stages after fertilization happens. And we can do that to see how new sequences pop up. And the reason why this is important is that this is the stage, so again, this sporozoite stage, that's the stage that's in the mosquito uh, salivary glands. So that's what can be passed on to a human. And so new sequences can pop up in this mosquito, which means new sequences can now be passed on to a human. And now that human might have a harder time clearing the infection because they're encountering, their immune system is encountering something different than it's seen before. Okay, and so one of the things that we wanted to uh, understand is how often are these mosquitoes passing on these more complex infections that will be harder for a human to clear. Um, and so if the mosquito takes a blood meal that starts out with a lot of parasites, so let's say 450 parasites, then what this graph is showing is that 90%, so this, this uh, kind of yellow or tan bar is about 90%. 90% of the time, it's going to pass on a, a new infection to the human that the human will have never seen before. Okay, so that's just looking at the parasite dynamics within a single mosquito. But of course, we have lots and lots of mosquitoes, and those mosquitoes are passing on their infection to humans, and those humans are passing their infection back to mosquitoes and so on. So we wanted to integrate this model that we have for the parasite dynamics within a single mosquito into a population level model uh, where these parasites and the corresponding sequences are being tracked. Okay, and so that's what I have here. So if you look at the the flow chart carefully, you'll see that it looks kind of like that Ross McDonald model that I showed earlier, where on the top here, you have the humans divided up into susceptible humans and infected humans. And on the bottom, you have the mosquito population divided up into susceptible mosquitoes and infected mosquitoes. But the difference now is that we're actually modeling the 
precise parasite dynamics within each one of the mosquitoes in our population. And we're modeling the parasite dynamics within each of these humans. Um, so it's a fairly complicated model. And this is called a multi-scale framework because you you're modeling the parasite dynamics at a small scale inside the humans and inside the mosquitoes. And you're modeling the, the spread, the transmission of parasites between these two populations. And so when you do this, when you simulate this model, um, you can test a lot of different scenarios, right? So one of the things that we looked at was, well, what if you have one mosquito for every human versus what if you have 10 mosquitoes for every human? So as you might expect, when you have more mosquitoes, you have more malaria. So this is um, the proportion of the population that is infected over time. So it increases initially, reaches some peak and then decreases. And again, you'll see these um, trajectories are kind of bouncing around because we've incorporated randomness into this, into this model. Um, and we can look at things like, um, like uh, thinking about the people in this population as a network where, so here each of these nodes is representing an individual human. And we put, put an edge between those humans if their infections are similar to each other. Um, and then we can apply some mathematical analysis that groups people into these communities. So the, the people that are colored the same color are placed into the same community if their infections are very similar. And so one reason why we're interested in doing this is because if, if our analysis lumped everybody into the same community, that would mean that maybe we can treat all of those individuals with anti-malarial drugs um, in a similar way. Maybe we can use the same types of drugs for all of those individuals because they have very similar infections. But if you're in a region where you have a picture like this, where there's a community of individuals that have these guys have very similar infections, but across communities, they have very different infections, then you might need to have two different types of drug therapies, for example, to treat people effectively. So this is the kind of thing that we're working on. Um, this is very much ongoing work at this time, um, but it, it's um, exciting to put together these different uh, components. Okay, so how did I get started in all this? So I'm gonna take a step back now from the, the research that I've been talking about and say a little bit about how I got into the field of mathematical modeling of infectious disease in the first place. So I'm gonna go way back to um, where my parents are from. Um, so basically, you know, how did I end up in Knoxville, Tennessee? Well, my um, dad was born on this tiny little island in the Caribbean uh, called Dominica. So you can see it here. So Puerto Rico is over here, Dominica is over here. So it's a small little island and it looks like this. Um, and on the other hand, my mom was born all the way over here in a tiny little village called Pleder in France. Um, so they met, uh, so first I should say my dad, when he was about five years old, moved to uh, um, the UK, Bradford, England, when uh, with his family. And then my parents met in uh, England. And eventually they moved to this part of France, Grenoble, France. And that is when I was born. And then we moved to Illinois, Batavia, Illinois, when I was two years old. And I've done a lot of bouncing around since then. Uh, we moved to Florida. I went to school in Florida, moved to New Hampshire after I graduated with my PhD. And then I had my first you know, uh, job as an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky. And then I came to Knoxville. So I just wanted to give you a little overview of kind of my, my geographic trajectory, I guess you could say, um, because you might think, well, you know, seeing this, it seems pretty unlikely that I would have ended up here. Um, but um, so this is just, you know, for fun to show you what these places look like that my parents came from. So um, both of my parents, um, uh, you know, grew up very, very poor. My mom um, grew up on a farm. My dad grew up or uh, was born in this, uh, um, you know, little town in Dominica. Um, and then this is where I was born here. Okay, so did I always want to be a mathematician? Um, and the short answer is no. Um, I had 
influences, uh, different types of influences, I guess, from my parents. They never um, uh, pressured me in any particular direction, which I'm really grateful for. Um, but, you know, just by seeing them be passionate about different things, I, um, you know, got exposure to both the sciences and the humanities in that way. So my dad uh, is a physicist. That's the reason we moved to Batavia, Illinois, because that's where the Fermi National Laboratory is. They have a particle accelerator there. And then my mother um, is uh, really um, great with uh, languages and um, has done research in French literature. Um, and so I had both of those kinds of things just kind of in the background as I was growing up. Um, and I was really interested in music. So I, I started playing the piano at age four. And so I always thought I would, uh, when I was you know, in grade school, I thought either I would um, become a musician or maybe a creative writer, something like that. Those were things I was really interested in at the time. Um, I always took math classes and science classes, but um, it didn't really occur to me to pursue that as a career at that time. But then I went to the University of Florida um, and uh, at that time, um, it, was, it wasn't required initially to pick a major, but you had to at least pick a track and it could be either humanities or the sciences. And I actually chose humanities, but one of my favorite uh, classes that I ended up taking was the history of scientists. And meanwhile, again, I was still taking math and science classes that I still really enjoyed. So that's the point when I kind of switched directions and thought, okay, I think mathematics is something that I really want to pursue. And I was particularly interested in applied problems. Um, it wasn't until um, maybe late uh, undergraduate or early graduate school that I started thinking about mathematical biology. I didn't even know about it before. Um, basically what happened is I, unfortunately, like a lot of people, I had some people in my family who um, were diagnosed with cancer and I started looking into, well, how, how can my mathematics, you know, interest and skills be useful for these kinds of problems. And that's when I discovered that there's this thing called mathematical biology, where you can use mathematics to try and answer biological questions. Um, and so that's how I uh, got in, you know, interested in working with my PhD advisor at the University of Florida. And she sent me to this program at Arizona State University at the Mathematical and Theoretical Biology Institute. That was the summer of 2009 which happened to be the summer of the H1N1 or swine flu pandemic. Um, and so um, this was a really big deal at the, at the time because um, it was a new virus. Um, it was affecting a different type of population than the seasonal flu typically does. Um, and so there were a lot of concerns about it and how to control it. And so that is what started getting me into modeling infectious disease. And that's how my first paper, mathematical modeling paper came to be, um, working on uh, trying to find the best control strategies for um, uh, H1N1 and seasonal influenza. Um, so that's just kind of the start of my trajectory into uh, mathematical modeling of infectious disease, but I'm happy to um, take questions either about research or about that trajectory or anything that you might um, be interested in asking me at this time. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Prosper. It was really good. Um, I think you actually answered some of the questions that this students had uh, to ask, but I'll, I'll ask them again anyway. Just, okay. um, so one person wants to know why uh, you chose math out of all the STEM fields. Oh gosh, um, I think uh, there was something about the, so I've always liked puzzles and doing puzzles. And so mathematics, you know, fundamentally feels like a puzzle. And so I think that's part of what kind of drew me to that. I've never been very good at memorizing lots of things. Um, and I liked that with mathematics, you could, you know, you, you need, of course, you need to remember some basic principles. Um, but then from that, you can, um, you can kind of reason your way through things uh, to arrive at an answer. Um, and so I think that's what initially really drew me to it. Um, over other types of um, areas of, of the sciences that um, 
at least at the time felt like there was a lot, there were a lot of things that you had to kind of memorize along with also being able to reason through things. I understand that. <laughs> uh, what and who inspired you to pursue a career in math and biology slash health? Were you more into one or the other as you developed your majors or graduate work and did they naturally start to overlap as you move toward your interests? So um, I, in, in, in my undergraduate education, I didn't take very many biology classes because as I mentioned um, at that time, I wasn't really um, aware about mathematical biology. So I, you know, at that point I had kind of decided on my major and I took, um, you know, some physics and astronomy classes thinking, well, maybe I'll work for NASA one day or something like that. You know, um, I wasn't aware that mathematics could be applied to biological problems. Um, and so it wasn't until graduate school that I, um, I was, once I realized that this was the area of research I wanted to go into, um, I had the opportunity to be part of a fellowship program um, called the IGERT Fellowship um, uh, that's funded through NSF. And in this program, we, um, it, it was, the participants were students from, and faculty from uh, math, statistics, geography, biology, and um, the idea was that we, each cohort of students would be a mixture of students from these different fields. And we would learn how to communicate with each other. We would learn some uh, of the, um, the tools and the um, you know, background for these different fields so that we could, again, communicate well with each other and work on interdisciplinary problems together. Um, so that was, uh, and, and as part of that, I also had the opportunity to take some classes outside of the mathematics department, which was really, really helpful um, for kind of pushing my, my research forward at that stage. Um, I don't know if I answered all parts of that question, so feel free to. Yeah, uh, I think we'll follow up was pretty much answered. Uh, what courses did you take in high school and college to get where you are now? And then what kinds of resources do you recommend that we might be able to use to pursue a similar career? Okay, um, so, I, so I think probably the, the biggest thing for me was that um, in middle school and high school, I, I would say I was probably um, um, kind of on a more accelerated track for mathematics. Um, so, my senior year of high school, I, I took calculus. And so when I started at University of Florida, I was starting with uh, calculus too. Um, so that was that was helpful, but I also don't want to discourage anybody who might not you know, have taken calculus or even gotten close to calculus in high school, because I've seen a number of examples of people who came into college um, starting out with college algebra, for example, and going on to pursue STEM fields, getting PhDs and so on. So um, that happened to be my particular trajectory. I happened to be, you know, I guess I was maybe aware that I was kind of strong in math early on. So I was on this kind of a little bit more accelerated track, but, um, but you shouldn't think that that's the only route uh, to get to this place. Um, the other thing that helped me get to where I am was to take opportunities as they come up. Um, I mean, you can't always do everything, but it's important when you're presented with an opportunity to consider it seriously. And if it's something that you can fit into your life and is of interest to you, um, then I say, go for it. Um, things like, you know, going out to Arizona, you know, at first, I think, you know, I was, you know, I'd never been out to Arizona before. And, um, you know, I didn't know any of the people that were going to be out there. And so those kinds of things can be intimidating sometimes. Um, but um, it, it played, you know, that that experience has played such a pivotal role, I think, in um, 
uh, kind of getting me going in, in research, along with reaching out to my advisor. Once I kind of thought that mathematical biology was the direction I wanted to pursue, I reached out to, you know, I saw who in my department at the time was doing this kind of research. And I reached out to them to see if I could do an independent study with them. And that's how I actually got started is just um, working with her one-on-one -on -one learning um, some background. Um, there weren't a lot of, uh, you know, mathematical biology is still a relatively new field compared to other areas of mathematics. And so your school that you go to might not have classes in mathematical biology, um, but if you have um, a mentor who has experience in it, you can reach out to them and work with them one-on-one -on -one, um, and get experience in that way. Definitely agree having a mentor is crucial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what types of math do you use in your disease work? We saw today some differential equations. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, a lot of my work uses differential equations. Um, some ordinary, a lot of it ordinary differential equations, uh, more recently some partial differential equations um, that allow you to incorporate more detail about, um, so for example, you could uh, incorporate things like age structure into a model. So um, different age groups um, or you know, people of different ages have different uh, susceptibility to a disease because their, you know, their immune systems are different. And so you can incorporate more of those types of details if you include things like age into your model. And one way to do that is by having a partial differential equation model instead of an ordinary differential equation model. Um, I uh, also use uh, stochastic models. So um, the example that I gave of the um, the model inside the mosquito, um, that was called a, it's called a continuous time Markov chain model. Um, what else? I think those are the main, the main uh, types of dynamical systems that I use in my modeling. So these are kind of used in terms of tools from high school, you'd use calculus to solve these equations, mm -hmm. use some statistics to figure out uh, the yes. parameters. Mm -hmm. Probability um, is really useful. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, calculus is, is a big one because, uh, you know, you've got the derivatives that appear in, in there. Um, if you're working with partial differential equations or another one I didn't mention is called integral equations. Those have integrals in them. Um, so calculus is really forming the basis of these types of um, differential equation models. Um, probability is really useful for those um, stochastic models where you're incorporating some randomness and uh, you know, chance into, into your modeling. So someone from YouTube wanted to know, um, as uh, they understand models provide information to guide public health policy, but not information about the likelihood of an individual becoming infected. You wanted to know if that's correct. Um, hmm. So um, that's a great question. So um, models can be used to answer different types of questions. And, and um, one thing that I want to, to mention is that the type of model that you construct might be different depending on the type of question that you're trying to answer. So one uh, role for models is to try to make predictions about what's going to happen in the future with the spread of infectious disease, for example. Um, one might be to test out different um, hypotheses. So, um, so I gave that example with COVID-19 where um, the group that I uh, had the opportunity to work with was looking at um, testing out different types of control strategies to see what are, what are the potential outcomes that come from that. Um, you can also use these models to try and understand how things actually work in the underlying biology. And so you could uh, construct a model, if you have some data to inform it, you could construct a model where you're trying to figure out what is the probability of being infected given that you have a contact with a person. Um, you can also develop models to, um, uh, you know, Try to, so for example, at the beginning with COVID-19, we didn't necessarily know, and this is, the, is the, the same is true for the Zika virus, we didn't necessarily know right away how this thing 
actually transmitted. Um, so I'll take the example of Zika virus um, because there are multiple modes of transmission for that virus. Um, and uh, um, one way that you can test what modes of transmission are uh, the biggest contributors is to have a model that incorporates different modes of transmission. And if you have some data, you can, you can infer from that data and the model which modes of transmission are actually producing the data that you see. Um, so, um, so again, you can use the models to try to make predictions. You can use models to try to answer what if questions, and you can use models to try and gain a better understanding of the underlying biology. And that last part is most related to the question about, um, can you use it to uh, figure out the likelihood that a person becomes infected given they have a contact. Pretty amazing. <laughs> All that work. Uh, last question um, is what are the most difficult mental or physical obstacles you've had to face to get your position now? How did you overcome them? Oh, um, let's think. Um, most difficult obstacle. I would say probably the most difficult obstacle for me is, is not getting in my own head. You know, I think it's very easy to, to think, um, you know, to question whether you're, you're, you, you know, you have the ability to do something or, um, you know, you, you have what, what it takes to do something. And um, when I was in graduate school, I was very much, um, you know, a take it one step at a time kind of person, you know, so I think, okay, well, you know, this stuff is really difficult, but I still like it. And um, let's just see how the next, you know, the next exam goes, <laughs> you know, and, um, and if that went well, then okay, well, I keep going. Um, and then before you know it, you get to a point where you've, you know, you, you have it behind you. And, and, um, and so I think that was, that was the biggest probably biggest hurdle for me, at least in those earlier days, is to just have confidence in my own abilities mm -hmm. and um, take things one step at a time. And, um, you know, don't be the person that prevents you from moving forward. Try and, um, you know, put as much effort into it as you can and um, and see that where that takes you. Um, in more recent years, the biggest challenge is, uh, is you know, being a parent. Um, I've got two little kids, they're one and three. And so balancing that with my career is, is probably my biggest obstacle right now, but it's an obstacle I'm very, very happy to have. Yeah. Yeah, the um, questioning yourself is something I think a lot of people feel. Uh, oh yeah. Having compassion for impatience that you can and I can do it and keep doing it. It's, it's something after my mm -hmm. too. <laughs> yeah, it takes time, right? To, you know, this, being able to do the stuff that I showed you, it doesn't happen overnight. It, this is mm -hmm. stuff that, that you, you learn and you build on over years and years and years. And, and, you know, talking to other people, learning from other people, that's huge. I, I have the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of different people and we learn a lot from each other, you know, and that continues to grow your build, your, your skill set um, over time. Well, great. Um, thank you for your talk today. It was, it was really great, really interesting and super relevant. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I uh, thank everyone for coming to see uh, on your Saturday. And this will conclude our last virtual Saturday series. Uh, for the summer. Thank you so much.